So I think that leads nicely into our next talk. We've been focused on the surface measurements for the past few talks, which are important uh, in a lot of ways. But as we've been discussing, it's, it's possible that you know, the, the vast majority of the ice that we're after exists beneath the surface. And so one of the main techniques that people have been using uh, for years now, uh, mainly in, in orbit, uh, is to look at the neutron uh, epithermal neutron counts, and so that's the topic of our next talk, given by Tim McClanahan, a uh, member of the LEND instrument team on LRO. Thanks, Paul. First of all, I want to uh, thank all of you for uh, the invitation, especially the organizing committee. I'm really looking forward to working with all of you this week. It should be a really exciting and fruitful uh, workshop, and I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it. The um, uh, first thing I need to do is also acknowledge my colleagues on the, uh, on the LEND team. We have the uh, International Cosmological Institute, which developed the LEND detector, uh, University of Arizona, which is Bill Boynton's group, University of Maryland, Raul Sigdeev and his group, uh, as well as the folks at Goddard Space Flight Center uh, represented uh, our leader there, is Gordon Chin, and certainly uh, the project science team on board LRO, which has kept this wonderful mission flying for more than four years now. The, um, what I'm going to be talking today about is uh, very similar to what the discussion that we just had with Dave and uh, Paul, and that is I'm looking at uh, the possibility using neutron measurements from uh, the epithermal detectors on board the Lunar Prospector, as well as the epithermal detectors that are on board the LEND instrument, which is on board, L on board LRO, the Lunar Exploration Neutron Detector, which has a collimated sensor for ep epithermal neutrons, which is allows a narrowed aperture or enhanced spatial resolution, as well as a sensor for epithermal uh, neutrons, which is an uncollimated sensor similar to uh, the instrument that was flown by a lunar prospector. And we're going to compare and contrast those measurements in making the case that hydrogen appears to be sequestered towards these pole-facing slopes. But before I go into that, I have a couple other different, uh, a couple other results that I'm going to review, and, um, and I want to go give you a quick lowdown on what I'm going to be doing. Uh, we have a, uh, recently had a, a video made by our Goddard Science and Visualization Studio, which nicely illustrates the accumulation of the LEND results over the, uh, over the past four years and really makes a nice case for a consistent data set that we see in the South Pole. The other thing that we have is we've, uh, uh, we've recently refined a number of our calibration techniques and we now have those techniques online and the team is presently vetting those and I'm going to have the uh, first opportunity to present those new results today. The other, and then we'll step into the uh, work that I'm going to be doing, which is I, what I've been interested in, was started with Carly Peters' work with M-cubed when she illustrated clearly it, in their suppression of their three micron band a correlation in crater topography in the mid-latitudes of being able to measure an insulation effect driving hydration in these uh, mid-latitude craters. Then I'm going to step into uh, an example in comparative planetology. I'll look at some Mars CRISM uh, results that indicate the distribution, thermal distribution, and, and water distribution is a function of thermal conditions in crater geomorphology. And then from that, I'm going to derive this insulation model from uh, a couple of different slope parameters, and we're going to uh, illustrate that we can see an effect on these forward-facing slopes. Also make the case for uh, using multi-scale analysis. Um, I contend, as Dave, I think, is, is moving towards that uh, this cold trapping effect is happening on multiple scales. It might be as small as, as is a few centimeters up to certainly uh, the large 100 kilometer uh, across craters that we see on the uh, lunar surface. And uh, as far as neutron measurements are concerned, it's very important if you're going to be able to make a robust measurement with high signal to noise uh, that we're able to do that uh, over scale appropriate uh, uh, regions. The spatial width needs to be appropriate for us to be able to get a, a good estimate of what the signal to noise is. A couple of fact another factor to consider is the lunar prospector which flew at 30 kilometers in its nominal altitude. It's an uncollimated sensor, so it has a st distinct advantage in being able to look at surface features versus, say, the LEND sensor for epithermal neutrons, which flew at 50 kilometers. So its ability to resolve should be about 60% less than what the lunar pr prospector would be able to provide. The other uh, answer to this in the design for the collimated sensor for epithermal neutrons was uh, the LEND uh, detector to use this collimator of boron-10 and polyethylene to narrow that aperture and enhance the spatial resolution of the detector. 
And then I'll step into a mid-latitude analysis in, based on some uh, results from M cubed that were presented back in LPSC. And I'll be talking a little bit, a bit about trying to extend this, this uh, hydration on this poleward facing side uh, down to lower latitudes that are akin to what has been uh, described by, in Lee et al. as um, hundreds to perhaps thousands of ppm at around 70, um, at around 70 degrees latitude uh, near both poles. If time allows, I also have a colleague's results, Tim Livingood, uh, who has also studied uh, neutron measurements by the lens system and found a hydration effect, which is consistent with what was observed by Sunshine et al. So this is the, uh, the video that was made by our science and visualization folks. I, I initiated the idea, and they grabbed it and took off with this. And it's a really great illustration of what uh, our coverage looks like. You can see right here is the, uh, I don't, there it is. This is the Cabeus region, which was evident very early on in the mission. First few orbits, we had a suppression there. And uh, if you watch that, you'll see also just above to the left is Cabeus A and Cabeus B. And uh, those were, uh, Tony remembers those, as those were some of the initial candidates that we had. I was also working with Tony as part of the site selection team. And the Cabeus uh, crater stays there throughout. And if you can see the time marching on every Earth Day, we, we took another picture. And by the time we get to June 2012, a year ago, Cabeus is still a prominent feature. We still have suppression here in our epithermal neutrons at Shoemaker and Faustini, and Cabeus A and Cabeus B are still uh, largely in play, as is Amundsen. Um, and so we think that those are some of the primary and most important results uh, that LEND has been able to, uh, to provide. The blue regions are the ones where the hydrogen is, uh, has the greatest expectation of, uh, of being there, and the greatest inference for hydrogen. And step forward another year, and we have our um, most recent results from the LEND team and our, our recalibration effort. Cabeus, and you can notice the narrowed uh, uh, resolution near the Cabeus region, which is up to the upper, upper left. This is from 82 degrees and above. And then we have this nice valley here. And if you've, anybody who's familiar with the topography uh, in the South Pole, uh, this valley uh, houses the uh, Faustini, Hayworth, and Shoemaker craters. Uh, and now we're beginning to see uh, the res that there are ridges that are beginning to get filled in. Higher epithermals here is a ridge just outside of Cabeus on the equator facing side. There's another ridge down here uh, that houses the, um, or contains the Shackleton crater. And so those regions, those higher regions that are uh, exposed to illumination are beginning to reflect higher epithermal rates. And regions that are topographically low uh, are beginning to reflect uh, epithermal suppression. And then there's also an area right here behind Malapert, which also uh, has a suppression in epithermals on the, uh, on the poleward facing side. So this is the, the result to date, and uh, this is uh, the one the team has, is moving forward with. And if you want to compare that with uh, what the Lunar Prospector had provided, uh, that is on the left. Notice the broadened suppression of epithermals near Cabeus Crater. The, uh, the white regions you see are the permanently shattered regions. And just for grins, what I thought I might do is, is let's go ahead and blur the CSET and instrument and results and see what we get. And we get, uh, we blurred this with a, a, a LPNS equivalent Gaussian kernel, uh, 40 kilometers full width at half max, and we see the, a fairly similar distribution of, uh, of epithermal rates. We have a slightly brighter region here in this, in this valley, uh, but certainly areas like around here near Amundsen, you can see a similar effect here in the uh, Lunar Prospector as well, and certainly you have a, the, uh, the broadened response here in Lunar Prospector. Also look at the epithermal highs. We have, uh, we have them here, and they're also reflected in the map over here. Um, also, this is the, the front side of the Malapert region, and we have a similar effect over here. So we think that the, in the, in the, the only way you're going to be able to get this is if the underlying epithermal spatial distributions of epithermals, when you blur these at, at that, that equivalent resolution, is that the only way you're going to get uh, a similar map? And I think this makes a fairly strong case for the LEND instrument. A couple of things we also have going on are detailed modeling of the, uh, the LEND detectors. We've been, uh, we've been under some criticism, as many of you know, and uh, we're interested in uh, is understanding the relative contributions from both spacecraft background and lunar contributions to our signal as we can. And all of those findings went into this recent analysis. We have two papers that are going to be coming out uh, that are independently derived 
uh, that make a, a consistent case for what those, uh, those count rates are. Uh, we have a couple, an updated calibration uh, paper that is, uh, reflects those techniques as well, the new ones, and a couple of science papers. So please stay tuned, and uh, we're looking forward to getting those re results out as soon as we can. Yes? They have different raw count rate scales. This is just the, the dynamic range. Uh, this was, uh, the lunar prospector was uh, an uncollimated spectrometer, so it's gathering counts from a much broader field of view than LEND, which has the narrowed aperture. So we only have about five counts per second in LEND. And lunar prospector was up, uh, this was their epithermal star, that, which is adjusted for thermal contribution. So this is the raw count rate and the dynamic range of the count rate that's in the map. So this is what got me thinking about the possibility of measuring um, epithermals, um, uh, I'm sorry, measuring uh, 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 the uh, hydrogen or estimating hydrogen uh, based on uh, using neutron spectrometry. And that began, as I mentioned earlier, with uh, Peters et al. and her analysis of Ryder Crater and the suppression of this three micron band as a function of uh, coming in and out of shadow and systematically illustrating uh, that suppression effect in uh, increasing hydrogen towards this, uh, these darker regions. The, uh, the second uh, was the, in a paper that was done by Lee et al. back in 2013 at LPSC, and he illustrated this really interesting um, uh, map illustrating after his hacky correction, thermal correction to his data, illustrated that the, uh, the green regions are diurnal variation in hydrogen content, which was between about 100 to 500 ppm above about 60 degrees north, and this is symmetric at both, uh, in both of the, the top and the bottom, is 500 to 2,000 ppm hydrogen on the surface is what they estimate. If that's the case, then these neutron spectrometers should be able to be sensitive uh, to that uh, level of hydrogen concentration. So this began my, my thought that we might be able to try to measure this effect. And so I began looking at, at techniques to be able to do that. Another, uh, another take on this is, uh, this was a, a figure that was done by Erwin Masrico. On the top, what we have is the uh, illumination distributions for the high latitudes, and you notice that they're very symmetric uh, distributions. Here's the, uh, uh, so the, each of these vertical bands is the illumination distribution, and these are area normalized, so now you can put them all on the same, uh, the same page. They're somewhat unimodal here in the lower latitudes, and as you go towards the higher and higher latitudes, they become increasingly bimodal as you reflect high illumination on, on ridges in the, in the high latitudes, and you also have areas of permanently shattered regions. And uh, again, a very symmetric effect here. And if you think about it, everything that is, on, that is down below this curve is essentially an equator-facing slope to some degree. Everything is, that is above here is a, a, I'm sorry, this is a pole-facing slope and an equator-facing slope. So what I did was, now let's take these curves and we're going to shift them down to here and we're going to overlay our epithermal rates from both the lunar prospector as well as LEND. And we see that they very well agree once the calibration is taken into account. And what I'm interested in here is this break in slope. This is where the epithermal rates reflect their first deflection in epithermal rates. Well, these regions are hundreds of kilometers from the nearest large permanently shattered area. So the question is, is what's driving these effects? It's certainly too far away for these large uh, permanently shattered areas to be accountable to this initial deflection in rate. And the amount of permanently shattered, this is essentially one part in a thousand. This is uh, certainly, these are results that were derived from Bill Feldman's work in 1998. Igor Mitrofanov in 2010 also validated that work and, uh, and also we see the same effect, a very similar effect in these high latitudes. So now we move into some comparative planetology. And what, I ha what we've got is, uh, on, I'm going to be referring back and forth between these two slides. And these are water frosts in crater geomorphology on Mars. And what we have is notice this nice, bright, thick deposit, this crescent shape, which gives way as you move towards the east and west facing slope. Now, if I had an, uh, a neutron detector, in that, which is, had a field of view there, and I was to center it directly on the pole, that pole facing slope, the greatest concentration of hydrogen would be right there, it, both from a, a thickness standpoint, a spatial width standpoint, and a depositional standpoint. It is thermally the, the most stable region in this particular crater. 
and this is going to be consistent with the moon, uh, given the assumed to be consistent on the moon, given the uh, assuming uh, uh, with the low obliquity that it has. In this particular spot, this is reflected down here. And as we move up and move in the east or in the west facing direction towards the equator facing slope, what we see is these, these deposits begin to thin out. And this is going to be true on the west facing slope as well. Eventually, we get to a spot right here where it looks like this flattens out. And what we don't know is what happens on, on the equator facing side. And, and does this, is this increase in, is it increasingly desiccated as we move in that direction, or is it not? And so what we want to know is, is, so if it's increasingly desiccated, then this plot would go like this. It would reflect a curve related to insulation. However, it's, if it's simply this crescent shape, and this crescent shape, if you move down in latitude, you would expect this crescent to begin to retract and recede back towards, uh, towards this pole-facing spot. So you should have this, this range of this effect should be much uh, steeper and slower, and lower, I should say, uh, as you move, down, move towards the mid-latitude. The other effect of this is this, think of this as a multi-scale effect. If I, had, if I was at altitude, my field of view would be much larger. I would subtend a much greater area around this poleward facing side. And so I would have a lower, I would be subtending much greater area so that this would cause a, a less steep slope, if you will. It would not be as hard a slope as what we had in the first case. The second effect that, this would, that we have to talk about, again, two sides of the same sword, is if the crater gets much smaller. As you move to very, very small craters, th then eventually this would become a flat slope. And so these are two, so if you're comparing two detector systems, the, uh, the, uh, the more linear curve is going to have the uh, lower resolution. And this is an indirect uh, analysis where you would suggest the, the relative scale of the field of view. A lower resolution detector is going to be the flatter response, the higher resolution uh, detector, which should have the steeper response. And we're going to come back to that in a few minutes. So here's where we develop this insulation model, I. We have two parameters here. This is a uh, slope parameter, which is simply the first derivative of the topography. Uh, the second is the slope azimuth angle to the pole, and both of these can completely describe any map. Um, and so if you look at the black regions that are here, these are pole-facing slopes. Uh, the equator-facing slopes are bright. The uh, gray regions are the areas in between. These are some degree east or west-facing slopes. The important thing about this is this is a scale invariant transform. I can take any crater of any diameter and I can now uniformly map it into this domain I. And so now I can co-add the relative slopes together and, to and find out what the enhancement in signal to noise is. Second part of this is we need to detrend our data. Uh, this is a high pass filter. Here's the lend results from a couple of years ago. Here's a map. We aggressively smooth that map, subtract it from the original map, and we're left with this uniform blue map where we have the uncertainties that are in the map are now a stationary process. It's very important because what we're looking for is trends in our data induced by the topography. And we're going to be looking at this in the context of poleward to equatorward facing slopes. Here's the first decomposition that we have to contend with. This is the average flux. Uh, this is Erwin Masrico. Oh, excuse me. Erwin Masrico's uh, average flux map, and this is from 75 to the poles. Notice how dark it gets. This reflects an insulation effect where he's taking the cosine and the angle to the slope and the incident solar direction. And you can see that it's darker. And this is the decomposition of that map into this two parameter domain. Slope is here. Poleward facing slopes are over here and very uh, definitive um, uh, result for this particular map. And we have a slightly different accounting of solar uh, irradiance over here. This is a binary accounting. Every time for several lunar processions, several lunar processions were uh, averaged over here. We take each of these pixels and then uh, render them into the map, and we have uh, this binary accounting, and we have the uh, lowest illumination in the upper poleward slopes, which is what we would expect, and then that systematically gives way to increasing amounts of uh, illumination as we move away from this upper left corner. Uh, also, another thing to, to consider here is that um, most of the area in these maps is down in the lower side of this, and this is due to the tremendous amounts of area that are simply in flat surface. As you move up in slope, there's a power law distribution, and so we have much, lesser, much lower amounts of area reflected here in these upper slopes. First result that we have is the LEND CSET and instrument, and we have, uh, again, the, the lower count rates are in the upper left um, in the slope. This is consistent for both north and south. I brought the illumination maps that I had to, to illustrate the, uh, this insulation pattern, if you will. 
uh, of uh, epithermal rates, and so we have a very consistent effect, and these are very well correlated at about uh, the 0.8 to 0.9 level using a Pearson uh, 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 correlation coefficient. The, um, we move on to the lunar prospector. We see this nice, dominant, broad response, and we'll come back to this broad response in a little while. A uh, very prominent effect for lunar prospector as well. This, uh, the Seton instrument, it, you can see in the north, it doesn't reflect this pattern as well. It's somewhat modeled, uh, much better uh, modeled here in the south. Uh, this is likely due to the commissioning phase orbits which we had, which were at lower altitude and uh, in the south, and so it, uh, the pattern is not as clearly reflected. It's certainly there, but not as, uh, uh, not as clear as it is in the south. Likely this is an altitude effect. Now we come to, the, uh, to this idea of uh, altitude and multiscale analysis and what this means, has, what the implications are to the results that we've got. And this is, if you consider this epithermal surface, and we have hydrogen, uh, we have hydrogen spots, if you will, of increasing scale, each increasing spatial width. Uh, they're all of uniform depth to, uh, to make it uh, a simple interpretation here. I contend that most of the lunar surface, centimeters up to kilometers, is in this realm right here. And we have, for these two fields of view that we have, which are of different spatial resolution, we have absolutely no possibility to see into these features. They're simply too small. So why, why waste our time looking at these features when we really need to be looking at features that are up here? So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be systematically masking off these smaller spatial scale features, spatial width slopes, and moving in this direction to see how this changes our signal to noise and where exactly it makes those changes. The, if, as you can see, the higher resolution field of view has an impulse response that is able to see consistently deeper into these, into these features until you get to about here uh, that versus the field of view, which is the, uh, the purple trace. And so we expect the high resolution to be able to see these traces better. The same is going to be true if you have an epithermal surface that is in the positive domain. So these effects also apply. The uh, Lunar Prospector 30 uh, is operating at 30 kilometers. This is the second aspect of this. It has a distinct advantage over the Lens Seton instrument, which is operating, the other uncollimated instrument, which is operating at 50 kilometers. Then the question is, is how well does our narrowed aperture collimated sensor for epithermal perform? And we're going to be studying all three of these together to see how well they respond to uh, these different operating conditions. And again, the idea is going to be to see how and where we improve, we improve our signal to noise by masking off features of a given scale. So here's, a, I developed a, an operator that's based loosely on a Pruitt um, operator. And what we start off with the base case, which is all, this is from 83 to the pole in the south. You can see these, these dark rings here. And these, what these are are the, the larger slope craters that have large spatial widths that are areas that we should be able to see into. And what we're going to be doing is systematically masking off these blue areas. The first mask that we deploy is, is getting rid of all of the white stuff here. There's a second one here that I didn't show. But in the end, the last mask is the one that it just is looking at the regions of large, spatially, uh, large spatial scales uh, to uh, be able to see what the differences are in signal to noise. Uh, from here versus uh, in this continuum of, uh, of masks that we are, are deploying. So here's our first result. Here's Lunar Prospector on the left. Reference rate for conversion to hydrogen is 19.5. North is the top row, south is the bottom row. And this Epson surface is, remember, we had to subtract a background. If the result is in this domain, it's hydrogen enhanced. If it's in this domain, it's hydrogen depleted. Another factor that we have to contend with is Bill's um, uh, group identified a slight um, uh, in, uh, effect of temperature on epithermal rates. And this is something that I have to uh, look at and try to separate at some point in time. But if you remember the altitude constraints that we were given, Lunar Prospector should perform much better than the set and instrument. And so what we see is, is the base case illustrates our point that we have enhancement of just a few ppm uh, in the all condition, and as we systematically move towards these masks and, and, and looking at features of greater and greater spatial width, what we see is a systematic uh, improvement in uh, the amount of, of uh, hydrogen on each side and also a change in the hardness of these slopes. In the south, it's a, it's a little more dramatic in that you have this enhancement for uh, lunar prospector in the south, and you have very little effect on the equatorward side. If you think about the equator-facing slopes, 
Temp from a temperature standpoint, they're going to be diurnally much uh, more, more variant uh, than you would have on the uh, poleward facing slope. Can I ask you a question? Yes. It's depleted relative to this, to this Epson surface. So what it means is that, is that uh, this equator or this equator facing slope probably has a surrounding region in which it is slightly more hydrated than what this equator facing slope is. And so when you subtract this background, it stands out as being a depleted zone, slightly depleted. You can see it's only a few ppm relative to background. So you always have to think of this as it's a contrast measurement, so this is relative what to what you it would see in the background. Does that mean you don't think that they do have a condition that is because of background? It's depleted relative to background, yes. And that's what this blue trace is here. Relative to its background, it is slightly more depleted than what the areas around it that are probably of of lower that are not oriented towards uh, the sun as much as the um, as much as the equator facing slope is. Again, altitude effects here. Remember, we had the uh, we had an, uh, uh, the North Pole had, was operating at a slightly higher altitude. And again, we have a, a, a much greater response here on the poleward facing side, and almost no response on the uh, equator facing side for the lens setting instrument. Now we consider the uh, the lunar prospector. I'm going to bring those forward from below. This row has been brought back from the previous slide, and what we see is the the base case for the lens uh, the C setting instrument. Uh, is relatively flat. And you see this is true for both cases, both north and south. However, as we systematically mask off uh, these data, what we see is it is increasingly bent towards higher hydrogen, which is what we described in the, in the, uh, when we were looking at the Mars Prism data set. Remember, we showed that this increasing bend, and we were making this indirect comparison to the field of view. And we, I suggest that this is likely due to the a higher resolution field of view than is provided by both the Seton instrument or the LPNS instrument. So now we're going to move to this uh, mid-latitude analysis, and what I'm going to systematically do is decompose in 10 degree bands this insulation model that we have, this two parameter insulation model. We're going to start at 50 degrees and systematically march up to the poles to see whether this insulation pattern is, is in effect and at what point it takes place. Uh, we're doing this in five degree increments, and so for each pole, we're going to each instrument, we're going to produce uh, six maps. And so here's the result from the south, and we see that the LPNS and LEN don't agree at all. There's really no insulation pattern reflected. Uh, this may be uh, something that's, go that's coming up here for LEN at around uh, 55 to 65. The LPNS doesn't reflect this pattern at all. But from about 60 degrees and onward, which is where Lee et al. Uh, had proposed that they saw this, uh, this persistent hydration effect uh, that lasts through illumination, uh, we can see that we have this effect that goes all the way to the pole. And this is consistent for, uh, for the lunar prospector as, we as well. Again, we have one part in a thousand here, and it's not likely that this one part in a thousand uh, could be attributable to this effect in, this in the 60 to 70 degree region. Same effect for the north. Uh, we have very little correlation between these patterns for the lunar prospector and the CSET and instrument. Again, uh, then we have this effect starting at about 65 degrees, and then it's consistent for both LEND and lunar prospector uh, moving. And again, if you remember, the lunar prospector was relatively flat response, and uh, what we see that is that's reflected here in, uh, in how broad this blue re uh, region is that um, for lunar prospector. If you remember, it's much more curved for the lend response, and this is tucked up against the top 20 to 30 degrees in azimuth angle. So just to conclude, the, uh, we, uh, we reviewed our, our brand new maps, and uh, we showed that we had a relatively consistent effect for both when we blurred the CSET and compared that, at least in a qualitative sense, uh, against the lunar prospector. Uh, this is something that we're going to be studying uh, and probably trying to put together abstracts for league as well as AGU in this comparison. Uh, the results that we have from our hydration analysis that the hydrogen uh, distributions are uh, correlated with the continuum of insulation, likely at the low end of the insulation uh, continuum. 
Uh, a possible uh, contribution to that may be diurnal temperature effects that we're also looking at. Um, below latitudes, this is again looking at the, uh, considering the Lee et al. Uh, result, below about 65, we don't see a definitive insulation pattern uh, when comparing these data sets. Uh, and then there seems to be this persistent diurnally stable hydration line uh, that begins in about that 65 to 75 region, which is consistent if you think back to the, uh, the, the suppression plots that we showed early on, this is consistent uh, with that break and slope that we saw in the uh, epithermal profiles uh, as a function of latitude. And then above 65, we see this consistent insulation pattern. So we think that that's uh, an important result. Um, then uh, also that permanent shadow is not likely a uh, factor in this epithermal suppression. And uh, this, su this suggests, again, the low end of the insulation continuum is, uh, is uh, probably responsible. And uh, the, uh, this, this uniform effect that we see is likely driven by a solar wind source. Uh, uh, we've decomposed this in a couple of different ways, and it looks like it is a roughly uniform effect. Uh, and uh, we also, com in comparing the poles, we note, if you think back to the figures we showed earlier, that uh, this is consistent, a symmetric effect when we consider both poles. Uh, this epithermal suppression greater than, uh, uh, than 70 degrees, probably the most important thing we have to say with regarding that is that these traps that we see are, pr are likely much smaller than the scale of the land or the uh, lunar prospector footprints. And uh, it's likely that this suppression trend that we see going up to about 70 degrees is simply due to a blurring of these much smaller cold traps that are there. Uh, the last thing that I'd like to say is that these upward curved impulse response functions that we see uh, likely suggest that, that the lens CSET instrument maintains a, a higher resolution field of view than the uncollimated lunar prospector or Seton instruments. So if you have any questions, uh, happy to entertain them. <laughs>